Welcome, everyone. My name is Michelle Washko. I'm the president and CEO of Life Sciences Greenhouse Investments. We are a Pennsylvania-based organization that invests in early stage life sciences companies. And it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Rick, to Lorenzo, and to Kathy. And I think it's best if they tell you a bit about themselves before we launch into our discussion about non-dilutive funding. OK, hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> Rick Jones, I'm with uh, BioAdvance. By Advance is um, basically an early stage VC venture investor in um, human life sciences companies. We do pre-seed, seed, small series A investments, anywhere from 50,000 up to a million and a half dollars. We'll invest in uh, almost anything related to human life sciences. Uh, we do some digital um, health, we do some med tech, we do some diagnostics. The majority of our investments, though, are in early stage therapeutic companies. So our checks at the small size might pay for one or two key experiments to get the company ready for a larger round. At the larger end of the spectrum, they're basically, um, we can act as a lead in a seed or a small Series A investment for, um, for that. Um, we're a small team. Uh, we can get into it more later, sort of what our process and so on is been around for 20 years. We're different from most biotechs because we're actually an evergreen fund. We're recycling money over and over and over again. That was originally given to us by the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, we're also a nonprofit, um, with, uh, but that doesn't mean that we aren't investing for financial returns because remember, we have to recycle that money. So good to be here. Um, thank you. Let me start by filing a complaint. This question was not in the list of agreed <laughs> questions. So now I'm unprepared. I have to improvise. Um, I'm Lorenzo Pellegrini. I'm the managing partner of Hatch Biofund, which um, is a new venture capital fund that was established, uh, I guess, you know, a few years ago, but we just recently became operational in the Philadelphia area. We invest in companies developing uh, therapeutics for human use and vaccines for human use. Uh, only in the greater Philadelphia region, so we have developed this uh, you know, highly regional focus. My background is as a scientist um, and uh, investor and entrepreneur. I carried uh, you know, this bag over there into uh, venture capital firms trying to raise money for my company. I was on the other end also trying to you know, find good reasons to deny uh, investment opportunities and so on. Um, and when it comes to the amount of money that we invest at Hatch and the kind of companies that we like, uh, we are really a blank slate right now. So you're going to have to ask me again next year after we start going out and, uh, and testing the market. So very happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And I'm Kathy Jordan. I'm the managing director of the healthcare investment group at Ben Franklin Technology Partners here in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, I am new to that role. I've been um, at Ben Franklin for six weeks, and some of you may know me with my prior role running the Coulter Translational Research Partnership Program at Drexel University. Um, at Ben Franklin, in the Healthcare Investment Group, we um, write checks generally between 100,000 and 500,000 with um, an average around 300,000 for the first investment. We do invest in, across the healthcare space, so devices, diagnostics, digital health, um, pharma, and um, we also now have raised two additional funds. One fund um, has been raised and deployed. That's the Go Philly Fund. It invests in kind of the best of what came out of the original Ben Franklin investments. Um, and then we're also in the midst of we're starting the Go PA Fund, which will invest. As many of you know, there are actually four Ben Franklins across the state. And that will invest in um, the best of the Ben Franklins from across the entire state with the goal of writing somewhat larger checks, right, in excess of a million dollars. Um, the other critical piece about the Ben Franklin investment is that we do require a match. The smaller amounts of investments will likely be a one-to-one -one match, right? So if we put in $100,000, let's say, in a medical device company to do a prototyping, we would want to see another $100,000 match investment of that. Um, if we're participating in a larger round, maybe the total round is going to be a million or two million, then we might write a check for 500,000 and we would expect at least a two to one match, right? So if it's a million dollar round, we might put in a third and then double mm. that on, on the match. Uh, and I think I will stop with there. Southeastern Pennsylvania is Philly and the four surrounding counties, if I needed, that wasn't clear. 
so maybe a good place to start is a shared definition of what we mean by dilutive funding, or I'll use, I'll use dilutive and dilutive um, interchangeably, so forgive me for that um, bad habit. Um, dilutive funding, so what we mean by that is funding that um, changes the, the capitalization table. It means that the people who are investing dilutive funding are going to become, anticipate becoming partial owners of the organization. And so that has ramifications for how a company evolves moving forward. So when we talk about dilutive funding, we're talking about venture capital, for example. We're talking about um, convertible debt, which means that it starts out as debt, but with the intention that it will convert into equity. Um, and some of you might be familiar and, and have been hearing the term safe notes. Safe notes and convertible notes are very similar. Those are all examples of dilutive funding. Sometimes friends and family money can also be dilutive. Um, but just to, I want to be sure that we're all um, have that shared understanding before we get started. Um, and we will start um, now. We'll launch into the prepared questions to keep Lorenzo happy here. And so um, we'll start with them. Um, um, maybe you can start, take this one, Lorenzo, first. Um, advantages of, of taking dilutive funding, and then we maybe we'll move to disadvantages as well. Um, yeah, I guess um, having seen both wars, one of the advantages of taking dilutive funding is that now you're no longer alone. So you have. Uh, if, if you find good investors, they can uh, really put your, your business into, into hyperboost mode, right? So now you have the capital, you can hire people, you can run all this project, you, you can start deliver, delivering along certain milestones. But, but again, you're not alone because now you have a trusted partner in an ideal case, the, the investor, the dilutive investor that will work with you because now they also have an interest in making sure that you're successful. And sometimes bad things happen, and we can talk about those. But, but generally speaking, in, uh, in the best possible world, um, you know, it's a, it can be a match made in heaven, right? Where everybody is, uh, is uh, feeding off each other, they have this phenomenal synergy, and uh, you know, as a dilutive investor, I may put in touch uh, you know, my, my shiny brand new company with all the people that matter in the industry and we'll put them in front of companies and they will learn and so it's, um, it's definitely, I mean, it, it's, it's not, it's not unreasonable to take that step and that's why companies try to do it all the time, right? Because you, it's, it's an almost an, an obligatory step to, to graduate into a different world. There have been companies that have become successful without raising dilutive capital. Um, but the capital has to come from somewhere. Like Kura Oncology is one that I remember uh, struck my, my, my um, I guess I remember from, from the old days. Uh, but typically when that happens, there is a uh, you know, very wealthy CEO who decides to bankroll the company by themselves and then for some, you know, they, they are able to secure non-dilutive funding through licenses with pharma, et cetera. It's really an exception. So. Um, I'll pause here um, to, you know, if somebody else wants to comment. Maybe Rick, do you want to comment on maybe potential disadvantages? Well, I'll address what people <laughs> always tell us are the disadvantages, and, and that is, well, you know, I, you're going to, I, I don't want to give up control, basically, is, is what they tell us. And, um, uh, the truth is, is that nobody's going to put in um, large amounts of money into your company without having some say over how that company is spent um, and, uh, uh, and the people and the decision-making process in that company. Now, if things go like Lorenzo said and you're on the same page when you sign the documents, You've agreed on a work plan, you've agreed on a budget, you've agreed on your milestones and your goals, then you know, those controls that the venture capitalist writes into their contracts won't mean very much because you'll be on the same page. They won't have to vote against you or push you in one direction or another. You'll be going in the direction you agreed on. It's when there are issues that crop up, um, maybe. Um, you haven't made your milestone. Uh, maybe somebody is not performing very well. Um, maybe the um, uh, it's costing a lot more money uh, to get to where you want to go than you had originally budgeted. Well, again, you can't just go back to the person or the fund that's given you all this money and say um, things aren't going well. I need you know another million dollars. 
um, there's going to be some pushback. There's going to be some discussion there. And sometimes when things have really hit the fan, um, you know, the VCs are going to have enough say to really change the direction of the company. Um, you got to remember that all this money that the VCs are channeling to you has actually been given to them by other people to manage. And they didn't give it to the VCs just out of charity. They gave it to the VC to go out, make money, and then pay them back. Those are the LPs of, of each uh, fund. So um, uh, the VC has a fiscal or fiduciary responsibility to, to manage that money um, and uh, do it in a way that's in the best interest not for their LPs. Now, again, when it comes to control, if you've agreed up front what there is to, to do, then that's not going to be an issue as long as you're going down that path. Um, it's uh, when things fall off the rails that those things come into play. So that's something to keep in mind. I'll just add that obviously the reason to take on the capital right, is to go faster, right? And sometimes that means fail faster, but it also means you can be more successful faster. Since I spent 33 decades in academia, right? I think go faster, you really frame that too, for those of you in academia. Um, a, a VC is gonna make a lot faster decision even than an SBIR grant, right? And so if you want to be able to move quickly, then that's a really great reason to go after that capital. I can also tell you that the biggest, some of the biggest complaints we get at Ben Franklin are about compliance. So once you take on that capital, you are going to have to have board meetings and submit financial reports, right? And so, and particularly because our funding comes from the state at Ben Franklin, we actually do have financial compliance issues with the state. So when we say to our portfolio companies, we really need to see your quarterly report, it's actually because there are state legislators who are very concerned about seeing how we value our portfolio on, on the back end. But even if I was an investor, um, a regular investor like Lorenzo, right, we would probably still want to see your financials. Um, and there's a certain level of discipline that comes with being able to do that. Essentially, life always gets worse. So as a way of, <laughs> as, as you proceed with your company, and then you have more, and then one day you go public, and then it's going to be a nightmare of regulation. <laughs> more but, complicated. You know, the, yes, 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 more complicated. But, but um, and the other thing I would just say as a kind of, remember, like, there's this, I, maybe this idea that you can, it would be much better to get non-dilutive funding. And there are grants out there. We actually encourage everybody to be seeking grants all the time. Because yeah, it's better to have um, that money on board. To, most of the time, those grants will be paying for things that the VCs, your investors, and your company would like to see done. But every time you apply for a grant, you're also seeding control. You have a very specific work plan. You've got to report back to the grant-making body. Um, you can't just take that money and run with it. So, um, you know, this whole idea of, of um, somehow there being a paradise where you get money and you do whatever you want to with it, um, whether it's from investors or grant making bodies, um, it's not really going to be the case. So if a company feels like it's ready to move, make this move from strictly non-dilutive funding to dilutive funding, what kinds of things should they be thinking about? Uh, well, uh, in our, the, I'll tell you the most, pre, the, the biggest issues that we usually see there are, are two types. One is you've got to have the team in place, number one, to manage the project that the investor is putting their money into. Nobody wants to put their money into a project that, based on the people they see in front of them, doesn't have much of a chance of success. They want to put their money into a project. Maybe it's the science isn't even all that great compared to project B over here, but you have a stellar team that has a record of success. It's been there, done that. So you got to put the team around the proposal and you've got to have a clear plan, especially these days where money is tight. Um, you've got to really be able to clearly show how that every dollar is going to be spent and how each dollar is going to add value to the investment that's been made. And that value obviously accrues to the owners, the founders, as well as to the investors. So, um, but there's got to be a very clear plan with clear milestones um, that um, 
you can be tracked by. So those two things, uh, frequently people come to us, they say, oh, we have great science, uh, nobody's ever thought of this before, but it's very unclear how it's gonna be a business, what are the steps they're gonna take to turn it into uh, an actual business, what are the value milestones along the way, are they raising enough money to actually get to the valuation milestones that they need to get to, so that then they can raise more money, because that never stops. Um, so those, those two things, having the right people and a clear plan. I also like to see clear differentiation, right? So to add to Rick's point about having a great idea, how do you know that it's a great idea? And I really encourage people, right, to do the very hard work to, to convince an investor that this is a great idea that nobody else ever really did actually have, right? So what does the competition look like in that space? What are the other possible solutions to that same problem? Crisp, clear value propositions. Um, if you have a technology where it's really necessary to go out and really talk to a lot of other stakeholders about that, please do that work, right? For those of you who are on the academic side, almost all the academic institutions in this area have access to the i program. I would encourage you, especially if you are in the medical device or diagnostic space, to make good use of those types of programs to really vet that value proposition. Uh, biopharma is, a, is different, right? Like as I've said to many people, no one ever questioned the need to cure cancer or Parkinson's disease. So if you're doing something like that, you probably don't need to talk to 100 people about it. <laughs> um, they'll all tell you that it's a good idea. Um, so, but I do like to see a crisp, clear definition of how, basically I wanna know how are you gonna win, right? And that means, that informs how we, you as the company and Ben Franklin together, how we are gonna win together. Yeah, and, and I think uh, only one more thing to add here. Uh, you have to appreciate that the, the cost of capital for venture capital funding is the most expensive cost of capital out there. It's more expensive than mafia money, if you want. So it's you know 30%, 40% a year. So we want to make sure that your investment is going to be give us a 5x return. Uh, and, you know, different funds, different. Maybe they'll tell you 4x and so on. But you know, 5x in five years is an enormous amount of money. So not every company will be able to deliver that, and it's it's very important, I think. So um, it's, it has to be part of that question: Am I ready for to raise dilutive funding or not? The first question is: Okay, is my business? Is worth 100 now? Is it going to be worth 500 five years from now? So, uh, if it isn't, maybe you're not ready, and you want to go back to do more non-dilutive funding and find other other sources of capital. But once you are with a venture capitalist in your on your cap table, then that is the expectation. And uh, if things don't go along a certain path, you know there will be changes that will be made. It goes back to the control issue that we were talking about. So. Um, <clears throat> I guess you know on, on the positive. Once you're a venture capital-backed company, you kind of made, halfway made it. Right now, you have press releases talking about your websites, and you have people that can help you put in front in front of their venture capital friends, etc. But you have to maintain that rapid growth path. Um, otherwise, things you know won't won't come to a happy ending. Can we um, talk for a minute about relative to rapid growth? Um, Rick mentioned the phrase milestones um, a bunch of times here. Can, um, maybe, Kathy, you can give us an example of milestones that um, are related to the science side and the business side, for example, and uh, what that means for investors to hit those milestones. Sure. I mean, I think um, easy ones right, are to do that initial prototyping, right, then to do animal model experiments. Obviously, I prefer to invest a little later than that. but. Right? Like, what are you doing that de-risks the technology to show that this works? So if that's going to be bench testing, to do that. Um, other things you can do, right, initial meetings with the FDA, certainly very helpful to inform the process and your strategy going forward. So those are all the types of milestones that I like to see, and I like to see a plan for how you're going to get that work done. Also, um, really important, if you've had conversations, right, what's your exit plan? Right? So if you've started to have conversations with strategics, then what are the value inflection points at which you might sell the company? Or if you think you might IPO this company, what are the value inflection points at which that might happen? So that we can really be helping you think, even if we're only looking at a million dollar round, right? I don't like to fund into a black hole. 
So I want to know that there's been a thought process around what's going to happen if we, you know, the next round needs to be 10 million or 20 million, right? Maybe you're going to clear the FDA and go commercial for your medical device. What does that start to look like? You don't have to build the whole plan, right? But I do like to see some thoughtfulness about what that process looks like. So where do folks who want to find non-dilutive capital find, how do they find you and your colleagues in the venture world and the funding world? How would you, how would you go about that? Well, the Ben Franklin website has my email address on it, <laughs> and I brought business cards. Since we're part of the state, we're actually very easy to find Ben Franklin. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, I find that entrepreneurs, um, good entrepreneurs, um, are very good at unearthing sources of money. <laughs> no, we, we, uh, we don't have a huge outreach, but we go to the, most of the major conferences. Uh, we have our website. Um, um, you know, and, and uh, unlike that, you'll hear this scuttlebutt about the importance of getting a warm introduction um, versus going in um, sort of cold to somebody who you may not know. Uh, we try, honestly, at BioAdvance to evaluate everything that we get sort of on an equal basis, regardless of where it comes from. But there's no doubt that if it comes to us and certainly at other funds, um, if you go into them with a referral from somebody who they trust, then you have a little bit of a, a leg up there. So um, what, I, what I, I'm a big believer in, in development by Google in the sense that there is, uh, money is very tight and there is so much that you can learn by taking the time that Kat got, talked about with uh, doing your research. Um, um, about what competitors are doing, what they've used as their development pathways, but you can also find out a huge amount about funding by just going on to the websites or, uh, of companies that are in your space, finding out, um, you know, just look at their uh, press releases, um, when they close their last round, who was in that round, look in their board of directors. Um, usually the major investors will have um, uh, representatives on the board of directors. Um, you can also um, um, just Google, you know, 100 largest biotech VC funds, and, and uh, there are a couple of lists out there. And if all that fails, um, email me because I keep a list of my own of all the <laughs> VCs that have closed rounds in the last few years. It's not exhaustive, but it, I think it's pretty good. And you really want to be going to people who have pretty fresh money. Um, usually they have 10 years to invest the money and get it back to their LPs. And so in that first three or four years, they're gonna be trying to do the investments. In the last four or five years, they're gonna be trying to get those investments back by selling their stakes or seeing if the company can IPO or be sold or whatever. So um, you, you wanna, the people who be investing or be the people who have closed their funds in the last two or three years, so. I do wanna say pro tip about interacting with Ben Franklin. We do see all the time the effects of the old boys networks. This is being recorded, so I might for, I get in trouble for saying that. So it is actually truly funny. I've, I said I've only been there six weeks. The number of people who actually know me and they first email the CEO of Ben Franklin, Scott Nissenbaum. So I will tell you very, very honestly, pro tip, you will not get a better review if you email Scott as opposed to emailing me or anyone else on my team. You are actually welcome to just email even one of the analysts and we will review you the same. If you email Scott first, there's actually a good chance it might just get stuck in his inbox. <laughs> so also, right, I think we all are really aware now of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, types of issues. So to Rick's point, we do try to review everything, at least review the deck, right? So that's why I try to say like, just because you've emailed the CEO of Ben Franklin, no longer really, really because of our concerns around equity and inclusion, that really does not ensure that you're gonna get a priority review. I think the gentleman had a question. I, I actually have two questions. Uh, one, uh, I know uh, Ben is Ben Franklin only takes Pennsylvania-based companies, but are the rest of you willing to invest outside of Pennsylvania? I can speak for BioAdvance, and we uh, we got our start investing in it with a similar footprint 20 years ago, but um, 
after having satisfied our initial contract 10 years into that, um, since the early teens, we've expanded our footprint. So we'll look at anything from New York to DC along the I-95 corridor, basically. And from our standpoint, we can invest outside, but we will not. We are exercising, no. Um, yeah, so this is an exercise in self-discipline on the professional, <laughs> that we don't have on the personal side, but, but yeah, we want, to, <laughs> we want to try and be, to stick to this, uh, this mandate, because uh, you know, we're not a large fund, right? We can't compete with the folks in New York, Boston, San Francisco, all the other places that have all the capital. So we, if we are to make a difference, we are gonna make a difference here, in the city and the greater Philadelphia region. That's where the, that's where our you know, two, three million dollar investment can make most, most difference. And you know, it's, a, it's a gross story, so anyway. So, um, <clears throat> and your second question. Second question. What is your experience or perspective going to corporate types of, uh, what do you call them, uh, uh, investments? So, yeah, corporate VCs. Yeah, yeah corporate VCs. So the, I don't know if all of the pharma companies have uh, VC-like things. Yeah. Or Google, we know, or, you know, is it worth going to? I can take this, 100%, yeah, absolutely, yes. They are VCs just like any other. Uh, sometimes they have a specific mandate in terms of you know, looking preferentially in certain disease areas that could be of interest to the parent company. But the reality is when you look at the track record, um, very few companies that were funded by a certain corporate VC were eventually acquired by that parent company. So it's. Um, you, know, you should definitely, in fact, there have been times in the history of biotech VC in this country where corporate VCs really carried the, the weight of the entire industry. Everybody else disappeared because they were holding the, the, their capital and corporate VCs continue to maintain all the companies alive. And uh, my guess is that during that period they made a lot of money, but yeah, you should definitely talk to them. I think the concern, right, comes from like, does that signal some sort of control or exit strategy? which I think it's one of those things you can pre-think, but like when you actually have your oversubscribed $50 million round and then you're actually trying to decide if you're gonna take corporate VC money, maybe that's the time to think about that. But you know, <laughs> I think in general, it's hard to raise capital, right? And sort of pre-thinking, would you or would you not take capital from what is clearly a qualified investor is maybe overthinking the situation. And the due diligence process that you're going to go through with a corporate VC is really going to improve your business because they're going to really give it to their own inside in-house experts. There have been rounds done with only corporate VCs, four corporate VCs, Pfizer, GSK, you know, all, all in in this company. So if they all had strings attached, imagine the disaster, you know, there are four, four parents. Uh, yeah, so no, it's, it's, it's a great idea. Yeah, I worked with Glaxo. This is a dilutive versus a non dilutive question. So, to your comment earlier, when you're looking at someone who is providing dilutive, you want, it sounds like you want to make sure they have a pretty deep Rolodex because you're thinking that if, I assume you're thinking that if they are investing and taking a personal uh, position, yeah. That they, you know, that they're that they're more likely to then inter, you know, introduce you to all of their contacts. Of course. The question though that I have is, are there any numbers out there in terms of success rates of companies that have been funded with the versus not? I'm not aware of a comparative analysis. I don't know if if you guys are, but. Um, Generally speaking, companies that continue to chug along on non-dilutive capital, they don't go far. Because you know, at some point, you have to run a phase two. So that's $40 million. How are you going to raise $40 million? And then, uh, well, OK, you know, there are certain therapeutic areas where you can do that, uh, antibiotic development. right? There was this company, Akeogen, that they raised, I don't know, $170 million in BARDA funding or something. Don't quote me on the number, because that's probably wrong. Um, and so they, they could do everything without necessarily, they also raised venture capital money, but they had this massive war chest. 
Um, so there are exceptions like that. I don't know that you want to start an antibiotic company, though, in this, in, in this time. <laughs> but, um, so I, generally speaking, non-dilutive companies that only rely on non-dilutive capital as their sole source of capital don't, don't really progress that far. At some point, you know, it just becomes too expensive. I, I do know on the medical device side, at least a, a few companies that exist more as lifestyle businesses on SBIR phase one and phase two grants. And they've developed an excellent model of SBIR phase one, as phase two, and then they license out the product, right? They get it to that point of development and then they partner with somebody else for commercial and then they go do the other one, right? <clears throat> we call those SBIR mills. There are other forms of saying that. I'm not saying that someone can't run a perfectly fantastic um, lifestyle business that supports you know, 15 or 20 people, that's just not a venture investable business. That, but the products that they're making are still quite valuable, right? Um, so I think it can be done, but those are clearly not companies that are gonna scale, grow, and then exit through an IPO. And those are also just different decisions. And one conversation I often have had with entrepreneurs is to say, what's, what's in your heart to do, right? Both of these are valuable. Not everyone needs to take on venture capital so they can scale and grow. That might not really be what you wanna do with your life. So uh, I think we can agree that it's never easy to raise outside funding, right? To raise dilutive funding, um, grant funding for that matter isn't necessarily an easy road either. Um, but um, I wonder if you could comment on the current fundraising environment, what it's like now relative to other periods that you've been through, and um, do you have any advice for members of the audience, um, given um, that the current environment is it's sort of very, is, is unique in ways? And we'll start with Rick. Sure. Um, well, go back to your original statement. Um, raising money is never easy, even when there's what we've just been through, which was an extraordinary period of, of fairly abundant, by, one, by some definition, venture capital for biotechs, it still wasn't easy. I mean, maybe if you were, um, you know, an MIT professor and you had 10 companies already come out uh, and uh, you wanted to start an 11th, maybe it'll be easy, I don't know, but by some definition. But in general, it's just never easy. Now, how do we stand versus previous periods? Um, there's no doubt that compared to a year and a half ago, things are more difficult than they were. But if you look at some numbers, that just takes us back to where we were uh, two, two and a half years ago when things actually at that point seemed pretty good. So, um, uh, you know, it hasn't, it's not really a disaster. It's not like we're going back 20 years, um, but uh, it is difficult. The headwinds, um, and that, that's sort of in terms of total funding. Now, if you're a, a startup, um, you're facing some additional headwinds. Um, there is less money going into venture capital these days, um, even on the biotech side. Um, funds are having, if you just looked at, uh, like I told you, I kept this list of funds that have closed recently. And then if you look at the last six months compared to say the year before that, the number of funds that have closed has definitely gone down. And that's partly due to macroeconomics um, where, um, you know, the LPs out there who had a lot of money to invest, lost a lot of money in, in the stock market or during the pandemic, and then all of a sudden they had less money to invest, so they had less of their fraction of that money that went into venture capital. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, the, the venture capitalists are, are having trouble raising new funds, which means that money that they do have, they're spending usually on their older companies to try and keep them afloat until times improve. So it is, it, it is difficult, but again, it's sort of taking us back to where we were three, four years ago. It's not taking us back to 1970. Um, so my advice is always the same to folks. I mean, again, you've got to have your team that investors can believe in. You've got to have your clear business plan, your clear milestones. Um, you've got to, and, and competition, knowing where you stand in the competition, not just if you're in biology against a certain target, but against anything that's going to be used against the indication that you're going after. So you have a new target against lung cancer, that's great, 
maybe it's only one or none, no competitors there, but there's a lot of competition in lung cancer. So you gotta be aware of that. So competitive analysis, and you gotta get out of Philadelphia. I mean, you know, I-, I You mean know, to raise money? To raise money. <laughs> <laughs> no, you gotta stay in Philly for other business reasons. You know, for all the reasons, cheaper, um, uh, much better lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. We love Philadelphia, I'm not, but- And the you, sports. But, and the sports. Um, <laughs> But um, remember, this is a global business. Your product's got to compete uh, on a global level. Your science has to compete at a global level. And your capital needs have to be met at a global level. You're out there competing in a global market for capital. So um, uh, just like you got to go out there to the big, if you're in rheumatoid arthritis, you go to European you know, uh, rheumatology meetings. You got to go to Bio Europe to raise money. You got to go to J.P. Morgan on the West Coast. You got to go up to New York and Boston. Um, and uh, you know, if you do that and you have the right science and the right team, all of which we have in abundance here, um, you can be on an equal footing with all the other companies out there, and you should uh, raise your money. Question for you: uh, When raising money, let's say you go outside of um, how often is it that startups will have multiple VCs invested as opposed to just one VC investing all of that money? And um, in the former case, if it's multiple, is it more strategic that way such that startups could balance the power and control against this interest amongst these people? Um, I would, uh, I'm happy to hear what other people have to say too, but I would say the majority of the time it's going to be a syndicate unless it's a very small round where you know somebody can write a, a single check. But for instance, our largest check would be a million and a half dollars. But it would be unusual for us to just write a check for a million and a half dollars and nobody else comes into the round. I mean, even though we, a company may be only raising a million and a half and we could do the whole million and a half, it would still be better for us to have two or three other people in that round um, to share the risk um, and also to share the um, sort of heavy lift of getting this company forward, sharing our networks, sharing our ideas. Um, so it's almost always the case where you want to have a syndicate for any sizable kind of round. 100% agree. It's also an issue of insecurity. As an investor and you're investing by yourself in a company, you're looking around and how come nobody else has invested? And, uh, and that's always an issue. Um, so yeah, in, investing in two, three, four investors is, is always great for also continued support, as Rick mentioned. Uh, you don't want too many investors, though, because it can become chaotic. And I've seen companies end up you know, in a bad place just because the, the board, the investor and board relationships became very complicated. So that reminds me of a question, a pre-question that came from the audience, um, and that is a lead investor. What exactly do we mean by a lead investor, and where do you find your lead investor? Um, yeah, I, I can take that. That's possibly the most difficult part of raising money. When you're going out to raise diluted financing from venture capital folks, uh, you may find many people who are just you know, saying, OK, yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting. I may be interested if you find a lead investor, I may put in. Uh, you know, a few million dollars, but you, we first need you to find a lead investor. And that's a little bit, I've, I've also, I've, I'm guilty of doing that also sometimes. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a lazy answer. It's almost like saying, yeah, you're kind of interesting, but I want to hang, up, hang around the rim. I don't want to do the work. Maybe somebody else who is the lead investor will do all the work, and then they will invite me in, so I get to participate in the success story without really putting a lot of work into it. And it also helps me, uh, you know, with my own investment thesis, because, oh, look, you know, I'm investing with this other investor. Um, so the lead investor is somebody who will typically uh, take a leadership position in looking at your, at your company, run all the due diligence, invest all the money and time to really understand what you're doing, and then putting a stamp, you know, validation stamp, and then they get to dictate the terms of, of the investment round, and then they'll go out and try to fill a syndicate if they want to invest as part of a syndicate, which, as we said, normally happens. Um, so for a, a typical early stage investment round, it could be $5 million. The lead would put in two, and then they will raise 
uh, three more, or you know, the numbers scale up, right? So right now, uh, Arch Ventures is doing three hundred million dollars deals where they invest one hundred or one hundred fifty, and then they look for similarly sized investors to put in uh, the rest of the capital. So, but finding the lead investor is the most difficult thing. Once you have the lead investor, you're almost half halfway done, right? Because uh, now they have, they will now take you and show you to all their friends. And, um, and, and things should go faster there. I think we're always looking for that lead investor to set the terms, right? So on the Ben Franklin side, when we're talking our sort of first round, we are happy to be the ones who are circling together. Like, right, like if you're working with angel groups or some high net worth individuals, right? And then we sort of say, okay, we'll be the ones who use, we'll come, you know, our term sheet, our standard terms, which are a convertible note with a 20% discount to the next round and a few other things thrown in there. Um, but then when it gets to bigger amounts of money, we also require that there be what we say is a more sophisticated lead investor than Ben Franklin, right? And that's because there are high net worth individuals who can bring multiple millions to a deal, right? And we really want to be working with that type of investor who brings the credibility and the resources to companies when they start to be raising multiple, you know, five and, and 10 million. Um, so, so for us in that initial stage, we're willing to be the ones who set the terms and kind of herd everyone together, but we're talking very small amounts of money when we take on that role at Ben Franklin. Then, um, you know, just to give you a little bit of perspective, uh, being a lead investor in a deal really requires about four months of work. Uh, where you just, you, from the first meeting, where you say, okay, you know, this is kind of, this company has legs and maybe it will become an investment, and then you, uh, then you map out your due diligence, then you put them in front of other people, then you take them in, then you have all the expert calls, and then, um, then you put in, putting a term sheet, negotiating the term sheet may take two to three weeks. Um, and then uh, even after, then you have to do your IP due diligence, and uh, then your legal due diligence, and then you have to negotiate investment documents. It takes a long time. So it's, it's a massive investment in time and energy. So um, that's why people sometimes are reluctant to take that leadership, because they can just piggyback on somebody else doing all the work. Can we drill down just a little bit? What do we mean when we talk about due diligence? Like, Give us examples or to describe what happens there when you talk about legal due diligence, for example, or into those kinds of things. Just drill down for so in case our audience doesn't know what that entails. Uh, yeah, I, I can start. So this is generally all the analysis that you do to make sure that uh, the investment in the company would actually you know, be successful. And it, and it comes, I guess you can organize it in buckets, right? So we talked about legal due diligence. That means in that particular case, looking at all the contracts that the company has. Do they have a license with, uh, with, a, with an academic institution? Then you're going to look at the license. Uh, do they have IP? Uh, do they have intellectual property that protects their invention, their product, their, you know? So, so that would be the legal due diligence. Or, um, you know, I guess part of the legal due diligence is does the, does the executive team uh, have people who have been disbarred by FDA or arrested or you know all kind of bad things that you know can be trusted. Um, sometimes people hire detectives to go snoop you know at, at, at the executive teams. Um, then uh, regulatory due diligence. You know, how have other drugs in this particular space been approved? What what are the endpoints that the FDA will request? Uh, you know, what are the potential pitfalls, et cetera, et cetera. And then commercial due diligence is uh, an important one. And I think, you know, as, as the point was made here already, it, don't under, underestimate that. That's probably one of the critical aspects of, uh, you know, whether a deal can, can work or not. Um, so what does the competition look like? What is the user experience? Uh, why would a physician prescribe this drug and, and so on and so forth? So, so once all that analysis is done, and don't forget the CMC due diligence, which is uh, you know, phenomenally complicated. Once all of that is done and checks out, there may be problems that surface when some problems can be resolved. Other problems are not, cannot be resolved. They become terminal, and then the deal doesn't happen. Uh, I remember one time in my prior VC experience, we were looking at a company that uh, we, were, we had a term sheet negotiated, ready to invest, and then a toxicology report came back with a very strange funding, finding, and then we had to kill the deal because their lead drug was no longer viable, uh, even though the management team did not agree with us. And so the valuation that we had was no longer, uh, no longer correct, and then the deal just blew up. 
so I'm talking too much, so please feel free to fill in the gaps. So if you were in due diligence, it presupposes you had a great first or second meeting, um, but what are some common mistakes that lead to not so good meetings? I, and I know that Kathy has a couple of opinions about this one. <laughs> I, I touched on that already. I, 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 I once interacted with a company who told me that their competition was um, was confidential. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you, uh, since this is clear, this is my personal uh, bugaboo. Yeah, if you send me a deck that implies you have no competition, you will actually get a letter back that just says something kind of like nice about how you're not a good fit for our investment thesis right now. <laughs> um, so I, I do like to be oriented to that. Um, I also do like to see some initial set of data, not everything, right? But one thing I tell people about data, I really like to see that the, the person who's sending me the information knows which data is the most important, right? So um, you know, if you have 10 years worth of data, you can always send someone 10 papers and a 60-slide deck. But it's where's the money shot, right? What's the key experiment there, and how do you communicate that? And part of that is I'm looking at is like, what are the communication skills of this person? Because I'm not the only person you're going to be pitching, right? You're going to, to raise capital, you're going to have to be having the same conversation with 10 other people. And your story has to be locked down and pretty tight. Yes, yeah, sir. So I, I know with angels, they typically take a position that um, they won't sign confidentiality up front. Uh, with the venture capital community or with Ben Franklin, what's the point of view on confidentiality? We'll sign them if we need to, right? One way, preferably, right? <clears throat> and we'll back to in, in, in general, VCs don't like to right. sign NDAs unless they have progressed the um, discussions to a point where there, there's sort of two forks where you end up doing uh, CDAs. One, one would be where for some reason you have to see the chemistry um, because you, you typically don't want to show your chemistry um, unless you unless it's in a patent somewhere and you've, or you published it or whatever, obviously. But th th that becomes one uh, fork. And the other is when you decide, if the uh, VC decides to go into full-blown diligence and they really want to be able to see all the things like contracts and stuff that otherwise wouldn't be available. But a big mistake about confidentiality, uh, to get to what Kathy's been saying about sort of common mistakes, is to, you know, overestimate what needs to be, what, what should be included under confidential. Um, I mean, certainly not competition, but a big mistake I see is people don't want to show any data at all, you know? I mean, you can hide the molecule, you can even hide the target, but um, you've got to have, you know, graphs or tables or something that show this is how my putative product performed in uh, scientific experiments. Because without that kind of data, um, we have nothing to go on. And we can't sign CDAs with everybody because we can never keep track of all those CDAs. You know, we look at 300 deals a year or opportunities a year, and that's, you know, small compared to a lot of VCs who might look at, you know, a couple thousand a year. You can't sign 300 or a couple thousand CDAs a year. Um, you could never <coughs> keep track. Um, and it just puts you under legal jeopardy. Um, yeah. Well, I, I've heard more from angels that they may be working with other companies that might be in conflict. So that's why, at least up front, yeah. they don't want to sign CDAs. I think they can get into it further than that. Yeah, but well, we won't sign a CDA up front either and, unless we get to that one of those points. Yeah, I, I signed one recently up front, but it was a very unique situation um, with regard to some business aspects of the company, which I obviously am not going to go into. 
Uh, but if, if we're talking like this is a startup that has a, one or two people in it and you're sending me your deck and your executive summary, we're not going to sign a confidentiality agreement for that, right? And you should set things up such that you can send people a deck and, a confidential, a, a, and an executive summary and have at least two or three meetings before you start to feel like you need a CDA in place. So. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about your funnels? So you talked, Rick, about seeing roughly 300 a year, if I heard you correctly. Um, how many present? How many go into due diligence? And if each of you maybe could uh, address that question or what your expectations are. I know, for example, Kathy's only been in her job six weeks, so maybe there's not a good frame of reference yet. But I know the FY24 goals. Uh, so, uh, and I, to be clear, I also only run half of Ben Franklin. We have a tech investment group that's run by Omar Menson also. So the numbers I'm going to quote are my half, right, and then double those. Um, so my half, we like to review at least 200 decks a year and um, provide sort of a more formalized review to at least 80 companies a year. Um, so we run that currently in three investment cycles that are a little bit more formalized with a process to meet with an external review committee. Um, but we also have mechanisms in place for people who want smaller amounts of money or larger amounts of money a little bit faster. So. Yeah, and I've, I've been told that we never have trouble meeting the 200 decks a year. Because I said, oh, is this too much? And they're like, oh, no, no, no. You're going to blow through that really quickly. So I'm assuming the actual number is closer to 250 or 300 a year. Uh, yeah, and you know, again, our fund just started. So we don't, we don't have numbers yet. But uh, the numbers that my colleagues are quoting kind of make sense, because that's my recollection in my prior VC experience. Um, and, we, and we don't have a structured process like uh, like Kathy does at, at Ben Franklin. So we, you know, we, we are we are flexible. I guess you could put it that way. I think it's it's probably um, accurate to say that the average VC will invest in somewhere between half a percent to two percent of what they see. For us, it's one or two percent of what we see, um, but um, yeah, the, the odds are that's why you got to go out and you got to present to a hundred different funds um, if you want to have a decent chance of getting funded. So no one here at this table charges to present or apply, right? But um, I wonder if you have an opinion about. Um, sometimes angel groups, for example, will charge a fee. Do you have any, or, or brokers who help you say that they will um, help you um, raise funding? Could you comment on, on your thoughts on those types of individuals or groups? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wait, this I'll, was recorded, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll start. I mean, we, I have good friends who are in that business of, you know, taking companies and trying to get funding for them. But generally, you know, that only happens after the company has been out there trying. Um, some companies haven't tried very hard, and maybe the brokerage is going to add a lot of value there. But some companies have really been around the block a few times. And um, uh, there's not much that's going to be added. So um, I would say a lot of it is, um, you know, you got to look in the mirror and say, how much can I really do here on my own? Um, generally speaking, if, if it's better for you if you can get out there and do the pitching yourself. I mean, ultimately, the VCs are going to want the relationship with the company and not with the, the middle person. Um, so, but if, if, if you really have never done it before and you just don't know what you're doing and you can get yourself a, a good broker, then maybe that's worthwhile. A lot of the stuff we see that comes in, we've seen before, as you can imagine, that comes in through brokers because they've already been around the block and, and, and we've seen it once. So we're unlikely to reconsider just because it's coming from a different source. Um, and, and I think I, speaking from uh, the, I guess the established VC community, what I'm hearing is that if a deal comes to you via a broker, the investors will look at it kind of skeptically and uh, suspiciously, like, why do they need a broker? Uh, it kind of puts in a different category. But there are good brokers out there, or good, um, you know, I guess, relationship people. And, uh, 
And sometimes they're helpful, right? Because you don't know how to put together a, a fundraising deck and they may help you with organizing your story and crafting in a certain way and maybe even customizing it for different investors. So if you have a good broker, I can see how that would, uh, would create value. Uh, for people like us maybe who invest early on, but uh, if you have a company that has already raised VC money and then they're using a broker to raise more money, then you have to wonder what's going on here. You know, I, I would definitely put that company in a, in a different bucket. I'll just say one of my funniest tech transfer stories was a conversation with someone that ended when he said, now, if you just wire me $7,500 to perform due diligence, we can move this deal along. <laughs> <laughs> we declined, obviously. <laughs> um, I think Brian had a question. For the privilege yes. of doing due diligence. <laughs> Please, yes. Karina. Okay. Um, so I want to run a hypothetical by you. Um, if there is an Israeli company that uh, incorporated in Delaware and found an office at Biolabs and had the funding from Israel already, but coming to Philadelphia looking for investment within your range, A, would you look at that company? And they have a key opinion leader from Jefferson on their board, for example. Um, would you look at that company, A, and B, how would you use the prior due diligence, let's say, from an Israeli investor? Hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a friend of yours? <laughs> I have great job for this. Okay. No, okay, yes, no. Uh, we wouldn't look at the company. We are f prohibited from investing in international companies. But it's a Delaware company, Delaware Corporation, with office in Philadelphia, with origins in Israel, yeah. but now they're here. Uh, we would look at the structure and, and see you know, what, 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 the, what the details are. And of course, we're going to look at all the pieces of diligence that were produced before. I would, right, like the real answer, right, um, if the money from Israel was being considered the match to the Ben Franklin Fund, I would actually have to check with our people, our legal and accounting people on compliance, right? I would still look at it, but the answer, if it's not compliant with the challenge grant that we get from the state, then I would just have to get back to them and say, right? <clears throat> my, I, so, first of all, um, I, th this question about Delaware Corporation always comes up because it's in our footprint. But you know, you can have your offices in Wyoming and still be a Delaware corporation. So we don't pay any attention to Delaware. We like Delaware because just for the general corporate law purposes, but that's all that it matters to us. It doesn't mean anything in terms of their footprint and our geography investment criteria. So we, we really would also have to look at the circumstances. I mean, have they really set themselves up here? Is this a... Um, uh, you know, is the company and the future of the company and the growth of the company going to be in the region or not? Um, if somebody's emigrated semi-permanently, you know, to the U.S. and now they're living in Philly and building a, yeah, we don't hold that against them. Um, so. <laughs> Speaking of structure, so um, a lot of startups, they start in Delaware, right, and they're LLCs in the beginning, but typically that doesn't work when you start to take, or often it doesn't work when you start to take non-dilutive, or when you start to take dilutive funding, rather. Um, can one of you speak to, to why that is and your expectations about being a corporation versus an LLC before investing? Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I was... Um, <laughs> Uh, so th this is my second stint in VC, and I've been noticing a lot of LLC, so I was wondering whether the world has changed. Uh, so I talked to Jeff Lipson at Cooley, you know, very famous esteemed lawyer here, active in, 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 uh, in the city, and he was, oh, you know, of course, yeah, you start in an LLC, then it's very, very easy to file one, one, one pager to switch to a C Corp. So I guess my expectation is that when we want to invest in companies, we will ask them to do that and that they will do it. So uh, we don't want to invest in LLCs because it's just a nightmare based on our own investor uh, roster. Uh, you know, we would have to file all kind of paperwork. So I guess that would be a request that we will be having. So we have just a couple minutes left. Other questions from the audience? Yes, Heather, and then a gentleman behind her. Yes. Oh, okay. So I understand from everything that we've heard here today that it's very difficult to secure capital if you're 
startup company. And it's very important that you're extremely prepared and ready to go that if there's interest, someone can start due diligence right away and start getting through and then analyzing the company. So what do you do if you're a startup but you don't have any resources as you're building your management team and you're thinking how you're going to develop your technology, but you have no money uh, and, or no, no friends <laughs> or no friends to support you? Um, and you don't have anything sort of put into the company, but you're looking for help, and you could be a perfectly viable company, but you're not competitive enough. And the moment you hear, sorry, that may not be, you know, you're not ready, that may not be of interest, it's going to make it even more difficult to get the support of all the other investors. So what sort of resources are available to local Philadelphia companies to help them sort of gain that momentum to be able to have that prepared first impression, very important meaning to start the fundraising process as opposed to just trying to talk to everybody that's going to, you're going to fail. But like, I'm just kind of curious, what other resources other than other academic institutions that are trying to do the best they can to help, you know, de-risk the technologies, help provide a little bit of support, but attorneys <coughs> cost a lot of money, registering the company, doing all the legal documents to get the company off the ground, thinking about incentive plans, capitalization tables, all of the things that are required to like sort of just make it to the pre-seed or seed round before you can even worry about getting to like a series A. Like, what, what do we have here to, to help all of our circumstances? It's not a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the first place to start is we have a lot of tech transfer professionals in the room, right? So raise your hands in case your folks, your colleagues don't know who you are, right? That's a really excellent place to start, right? But beyond that, so please, panelists. <laughs> I touched on the i -Corps program, right? That's open to almost every academic institution <clears throat> um, that does come with money. Um, also, if you're on the academic side and you have um, grants from about 10 specific institutes, I can't rattle them all off, but um, NIBIB is one, NIDDK, mental health. Um, there's a few others. They all have access, if you have an R01 or an SBIR grant, to a program called 3CI. Um, you can just Google 3CI, or some, I think on some NIH websites it's still called C3I. That actually provides you with essentially a mini board for six months advice, um, and it's funded as a grant supplement to one of those other mechanisms. Um, full disclosure, I did consult for that program for about ten, uh, five years, so that's why I know about it, but it's, it's actually a great program. Um, so the Science Center, of course, their Capital Readiness Program, I think they've done one or two rounds of Capital Readiness. I've heard really good things about it thus far for people who are trying to get their decks ready. Um, so we definitely encourage you to avail yourself of the resources at the Science Center, um, drop by, Venture Cafe, et cetera. Did I turn off? No, I didn't turn off my microphone. OK. <laughs> and, and I think. Um, so these are obviously great resources that are unique to this region, but uh, generally speaking, I think you, you want to identify two people. Uh, well, you need a patient spouse, right? Because they're going to go without a, without a salary for quite a while. Uh, but you need a rainmaker, and you need a grant writer. And there are people who are extremely good at this. Uh, the grant writer person, there is one in Dolestown of the Pennsylvania Biotechnology Center, and you know, she, they just write grants. They're good at writing grants, and they'll get your grants through the finish line. Um, and that's how you're going to start the company, right? With some money that you can use to do a, run experiments, and maybe you're not going to be able to pay yourself all that much, but, but that's how it works. And then the rainmaker, you know, think about people like local people like Jeff Marazzo, Bruce Peacock, uh, people who are very well connected. They have made money before for other investors, and once. If you can convince them to help you out, maybe be on your board of directors, then that completely changes the the picture for you because oh, now you are. Uh, Bruce Beaker company or a Jeff Maraza company. And, and so unfortunately, we don't have as many here as they have in Boston. But those are the key, the key people. Um, and especially if they decide to put in a little bit of their own personal money in your company, that could go a very long way. Who were the names you guys? Yeah, we do. <laughs> a lot of the law firms also have um, programs that are pretty oh, yes. fee for, flat fee for service, right? And um, to do those initial corporation documents. So I sort of, you know, I mean, I realize you said you're starting from nothing, um, but 
I, so nothing, truly nothing can be difficult, right? But many of the law firms do have. Ballard Spar, I know, has one. I forget who else has these kind of early stage programs that will help. Oh, Dwayne Morris, yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I should be careful about mentioning specific law firms. Um, but, you know, and I do actually, on the legal side, I do really encourage people to, a, a little legal advice up front will save you a lot of money if something goes wrong um, on the other end. And I think that's an underappreciated aspect of spending that tiny bit of money. I mean, I know it sounds crazy, the amount of money that lawyers charge per hour, but they can be extremely efficient. And $1,500 of really good legal advice, you will be very grateful for if something goes wrong later. And then I, I, I would just say there, uh, there's a lot of, you, you can get a lot of free advice around this town, uh, including legal advice, um, fundraising advice, um, regulatory advice, commercial advice. If you just remember that developing any, one, any, any product in this space is not a solo endeavor. It's not something that you know, if you just had enough money and enough time you could do in your garage by yourself. It's always a matter of building a network, building a team. And you can build a, quite an extensive virtual team uh, for basically nothing by reaching out, um, meeting people, asking for little favors, whatever, and um, you know, once a actually having that virtual team on your pitch deck can be a huge uh, advantage for you going forward. I mean, obviously those people have to agree, you know, they're gonna, yeah, they'll back you up, but um, you, it, so if, if you are an introvert and you just wanna do the thing in your garage, it's, and by the way, it's not just that you won't earn any money. You probably will have to spend some of your own money too. If you're not willing to spend ten or twenty thousand dollars of your own money to get some things done, then that's an issue. But if you if you can get beyond the introvert stage, reach out, create this virtual um, company around you, um, you will find that you can accomplish an awful lot with not a lot uh, of cash. One more quick question. That is a nice note to end on, but we one more quick question. And then um, the gentleman here, um, I think a few of us can stay for just a couple of minutes, but we do need to um, head out the door here at five um, oh. because of WISTAR rules. But um, this gentleman here, and then um, you over here, and then we'll be done. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback off of um, the panel. I, I mean, there, there are definitely like different touch points, and as Rick said, um, a lot of folks would, would happily give you 30 minutes. So there is a lot of that. There are a lot of good attorneys that don't do deferred, um, deferred invoices and things like that. But they're, more than that, they're very networked. Um, so, and then the tech transfer offices and things like that. So definitely, I mean, I know, I know what I did is like, you have your own universe and then you'll eventually calm down and you, you know the ones that are gonna work with you, help you work with you. So eventually it'll work out. But well, my question to the panel is, um, so, I'm Thomas Kim, I'm running Epiberio, it's a pen spin out. And what, what I've been doing in this life cycle is um, the downturn and in terms of the, 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 you know, uh, what's going on in the macro, you know, public space, and, uh, public finance space, and pushing down into the uh, private you know, venture world. Um, so there's been a lot of um, advice being given at this point for a company like us Think about you know, you know um, smaller fundraise for short term. Like we just got out of this creative construction lives this accelerator out of Toronto. But you know, so we're we're looking at it from this side that way uh, to buy us some more time to hit like, the earlier milestones. What are you seeing on the you know as a, as an investor? Like how are how are things changing for you now that we're like you know year and a half? Definitely seeing a lot of bridge rounds being raised, right? Does that answer your question? <laughs> um, yeah, it kind of makes sense. It depends on um, it depends on your expectations about how long it will take for the market to recover. But you know, going back to a point that Rick made, investors did raise a lot of money, venture capitalists, and, you know, before this this latest dip that we've had, and that money they can't sit on it; they have to invest it. 
So they can't hold on to it for a long time. So all the, all the money that was raised in the peak years will be deployed over the next five years. And so maybe the first year they're taking a pause, waiting for the market to readjust. At some point, they're going to have to push it out. So bridging one year may be a good strategy. Whether you do it with a bridge note or with an equity round, small equity round. Uh, but, but maybe one year is around the right, the right time frame. I don't have a crystal ball, but it seems reasonable. Sir? Yeah. I I had a related question about some people's, you know, uh, milestones are essentially other people's proof of concept studies. You know, I'm, I'm concerned about very early development. I talk to faculty, and they're they're talking about their invention. We set up their IP. What what appetite is there in the investment community to say fund? very small projects that would get something that has IP behind it to the point where they would actually meet you for, uh, an, uh, for an early conversation. You know, that they're even, like, if, if Heather says that she has zero, this is the point where you're less than zero. But Ben Franklin will still put a $100,000 match. The trick is that you have to have the match, right, to get the money, but if you're talking really small amounts of money to do some early stage prototyping, or if you have a digital health product and you're trying to acquire well, your first I mean, there, three there's customers. There's a question about certain things that absolutely need to be done, but may in and of themselves be somewhat more expensive than, um, you know, a, like for example, if you were working in the neuro field and you needed to do a primate study, there's no such thing as a cheap primate study, but it's absolutely essential for commercialization. But it can't stand on its own. It would be a milestone in some few people's view. It'd be a proof of concept in other people's view. And I could see how, if it were a proof of concept, no one would be interested. So, I, I mean, is is there a, is there an appetite for finding these people who are interested in funding proof of concept stuff? Or um, that's also going to be a bio strategy partner. Right. Yeah. I, I think the short answer is um, there are different investors for different types of um, stages of companies. So um, there may, for instance, at BioAdvance, like I said, we will write sometimes smaller checks um, for specific experiments that basically stage the company for, you know, set them up for a later round of investment. Um, so that's something that we'll consider. You know, you go to another company that doesn't want to write checks less than five or ten million dollars, then they won't think they won't consider that. So um, it's a matter of finding the right investor for the um, with the right focus. I think also if you're really looking for that very early stage proof of concept, it's going to be success or fail, right? If that's really really what you need, then you're going to you're going to give a lot up in terms of wait what your hoped for valuation might be and what kind of chunk of the company we might take for that level. Of risk, right? Yeah, I always so, like, if somebody says, "Oh, it's proof of concept," but I think my pre-money is five million, then I'll be like, "Well, actually, we're not anywhere close to the same page about your pre-money." So, like, <laughs> well, we could uh, go into a deep dive on valuations here. So, I think, uh, given our time constraints, and now's a really good time to, to call it an evening and afternoon. Thank you very much, audience. Please um, join me in thanking Larry. <laughs>